Thank you, Dr. Jansen. And good evening. Good evening. Oh, you know, awake. Well, the psalmist says these words from the rising of the sun unto the setting of the same. And we do praise the name of the Lord for this evening, regardless of the fact that some of us um, may have had to do some very careful driving to get here, or at least to go home. Some of us are wise enough that we plan we'll stay over in Wolfville this evening and uh, to be safe. But this evening, it gives me great honor on your behalf to welcome among us our esteemed guest, Dr. Rod Wilson, his wife, Bev. Welcome again this evening. And we, sure, we surely are anticipating the second blessing of hearing from you. See, it's our honor to welcome you here this evening because in our estimation from what has already been said last night, you have distinguished yourself as a scholar, as an author, as an administrator, a counselor, a teacher, a friend. But most of all, a Christian and a husband and father. Thank you for sharing your story with us so transparently last evening. And it helps us to see the human side of those whom God has called into ministry. Thank you. That was a very bold move, and I'm sure God will bless that in the lives of all of us. I tried to push him today to ask, to, to tell me something more about him, himself, in terms of beyond the professionalism and so forth. And he says, well, say anything you want to say. And that, as somebody said, that's, uh, that's almost like, a, uh, they say, if you say, that don't say, or rather, saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick him to a dog. And to tell somebody to say anything with a mic in their hand, you know, that's dangerous. Anyhow, I find that we are related. I can say that, can't I? Yeah, we are related. It dawned on me last evening, on the very far reaches of the Irish in this world, as I listened to his story, I suddenly had this reflection of my childhood of knowing this little community called Irish Tongue in the middle of South, well not in the middle, but in the northeastern part of South America in Guyana. And then it dawned on me, well that must have been something between the British and the Irish and I wouldn't go there. But there's a connection. There's a connection. But beyond that little bit of humor, um, Rod is not all work. He enjoys walking loves to uh, live next to the water. You're welcome to move to Nova Scotia. And um, he also is an avid golfer and uh, wishes that he can do more of that now. Um, and so here is a person who is with us so accomplished but still has time for family and time for fun. And I'm looking forward to the... I learned from listening to you, sir, that you, your greatest vocational interest, however, is to ensure that people are restored to the image of God, one person, one community of faith at a time, so that in the end, all of us, in you know, our identity that is rooted in grace, that is clearly understood in our competence can also rest in God's Sabbath in that restored image of God that is available to us in Jesus Christ. And we are already blessed in that direction, having spoken to many. And we pray tonight that God will use you mightily in that end. Would you please come forward and as he comes, would you welcome him? I'd like to pray with you, Brother Rod. Yes, watch it. Oh, I guess. Father, we, in our prayer this evening, simply reflect on the words of Paul to the Philippians, thanking you for this partnership in the gospel with Rod, the gospel of Christ. 
praying tonight, O oh God, that you will continue in him the work of grace to its final perfection. And that his love for you and your church abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. That you might always choose what's excellent with the best and purest of motives. That Lord, his ministry among us this week may continue far beyond this time and express in fruits of righteousness through the indwelling power of Christ by your spirit. And in this, may you receive all the glory and honor and praise as you anoint him by your spirit and give him that sense of liberty and freedom that only Christ gives. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Um, I uh, have been looking all my life for my rich Irish uncle, so I think I may have found him tonight, maybe. I'm really glad you're all here. Uh, the first time Harry connected with me about this uh, lectureship, uh, almost the second sentence was about the weather. He said, this is February and people may not show up. I suspect you may do that with all your lectures in case people don't show up for other reasons, but um, I'm very impressed the fact that all of you are here tonight. I did think it was going to be two or three gathered in Jesus' name uh, when I heard all the weather reports, so I'm very glad that you're all here. And uh, for those of you who are not here and listening later on, um, hopefully you uh, are safe where you are uh, while we are here. Uh, how many of you were not here last night? Uh, those of you with propensity to guilt, please don't feel bad, but I'm just interested. Uh, just put your hands up a little higher. Thank you. I know you're Baptist, you don't like raising your hands, but... Um, okay, that's helpful. Last night, we uh, started our conversation about uh, identity and looking not out the window, but inside the window. And I suggested last night that... Uh, while a lot of the discussion in pastoral ministry these days is about what we need to do and being missional and being outward looking, and that's all important and necessary, uh, what we also need to do is we need to look in and we need to understand where identity is rooted. And last night we uh, spent the whole session looking at whether our identity is rooted in grace or whether identity is rooted in needing to perform in order to be accepted. And uh, when you stand up and say these kinds of things to an audience where you don't know anybody, you feel like, maybe it's just me. <laughs> uh, but from all the conversations I've had since I stopped last night, I think there's more, more Wilsons out there than I realized. Uh, I have a big family. Um, so for those of you who are not here, you can speak to somebody who was and uh, test them and see if they can uh, tell you what uh, we talked about last night, or you can pick it up on tape. The other thing I said last night was that I think biography and theology need to be taken together. One of the hazards, it seems to me, of theological education is often we make assumptions about people's biography and we don't really uh, take it seriously. And then, as I said last night, many pastors and people in Christian leadership who fall or have difficulties, it's often issues related to their own story, not God's story. And the last time you know a pastor that left the church, my hunch is they left the church not because of some theological problem, but something that's probably rooted in their own story, in their own narrative, and that's where the difficulties come. And so it's my intent in these three sessions to invite you to think about biography and theology, but also uh, to both lead you in that and hopefully model the importance of doing that. Uh, the other proviso I just want to say at the beginning, for those of you who were not here last night, I'm using pastor in the large P, small P sense. Uh, those who have the office, those who are actually involved in so-called full-time ministry, a phrase that should be expunged from the vocabulary of all Christians, uh, but those of you in full-time ministry, as well as those who are in whatever the other thing is, uh, that are doing lay pastoral ministry. We're all in full-time ministry, it just depends where it's located. Uh, but I'm using pastor in both the small P and the large P sense. Tonight we're going to talk about professional window. Last night was the personal window, whether we have a clear understanding of grace. And tonight is the professional window, whether our identity is rooted in a clear understanding of competence. 
Competence is a difficult subject for many, many reasons, and we're going to unpack some of these tonight together. But um, I have spent a lot of my Christian life confused by competence because of all the different messages that I've got. And I would say at this point, I think I'm a little clearer than I was when I was younger, but I wish somebody had talked to me about real competence and what competent leadership means when I had started off. Because my own uh, experience in leadership, and I suspect like many of you here, is the messages that I got on leadership early on and the messages I got in competence early on were straight out of the culture and had very little to do with the Bible. And a lot of the leadership literature, and unfortunately I have to say publicly, even in Christian bookstores, are not rooted in Scripture. They're rooted in other mindsets, other values, other ideologies, and unfortunately the Church of Jesus Christ is not just in the world, but also of the world when it comes to some issues related to competence. And so it's been confusing to me, as somebody who's had a lot of leadership roles, to understand what competence is. When I grew up uh, as a teenager in the church, in an evangelical church, uh, one of the things that was very clear to me was that piety was more important than intellect. Um, I feel experience when I was younger that you had a choice. You were either smart or you were spiritual. Spiritual people often weren't very smart, and smart people often were not seen as very spiritual. And so this dichotomy between smart and spiritual uh, actually got formed very early in my teenage experience. Added to that was the distinction between head and heart. That the Christian life was not about the head, the Christian life was about the heart. And that kind of language, for those of you who studied theology, will know uh, you can't study theological anthropology and draw the distinction between the head and the heart. Uh, if you've studied anthropology and scripture, you'll know that that is not a good distinction. But it's very much part of the culture, the distinction between the head and the heart. And head was linked with intellect, and head was linked with the academic world, and heart was linked with prayer and Bible study. And, and uh, that sense of piety before God seemed to trump those other areas. And so if you were smart, or if you were academically oriented, or if you were seen as intellectually oriented, that was seen as the opposite of just a simple reading of the Bible with the Holy Spirit. And many of you grew up in that kind of context, and maybe some of you still live with that kind of dichotomy. The dichotomy between competence is really resident in the pious disciplines of the Christian life, and the intellectual side of the life, or the more cognitive side of, of the spiritual life, is seen as a threat to that. So if you're competent in the intellectual side, then somehow you're not as spiritual. I know many people, as I'm sure you do, who've left the church because they considered their IQ to be too high for the church. Not because of how they see, saw themselves, but because of how they were caricatured by the church. That somehow they were smart, and that wasn't seen as spiritual. And competence got allocated to a certain strain of the Christian life, and not to other strains. Those of you who are faculty at Acadia Divinity School, or other divinity schools, will have lived that experience as I have. Many of us, who are in the academy, are not seen as spiritually oriented as people who are not. And all of a sudden you realize that we have some funny views of competence. When I was in pastoral ministry, we had one leader in our leadership team who had problems with me for all kinds of reasons that I will not say publicly, nor on tape or DVD. <laughs> when he didn't like a sermon that I gave, he would call it academic. And it was interesting, I learned very early on in pastoral ministry that people who were having trouble following what you were saying because it made them think a little too much in church consider that to be academic, and that was a swear word. That was a bad thing. Those of us who are in the academy, when we're told we're academic, we consider that to be adulation and praise. But in the church, when something is described as academic, most of us know what that means. It probably means the person didn't understand what you were saying, and that may more have to do with their ears than your tongue. But they're also telling you that it's not spiritual. And even though you may consider yourself to be competent in that area, it's missing something else. I've worked in Christian organizations, as you have, where people have been fired. Some of them fired inappropriately, insensitively, with bad process, etc., etc., and we've probably all got those kind of war stories. But some of them were fired for incompetence. 
And it's very interesting the conversations that go around churches and go around Christian organizations when somebody is fired for incompetence. Everybody wants to talk about the person's character and they love Jesus. And sometimes you get the impression that if you love Jesus, you can never be fired. Or if you love Jesus, you can never be incompetent. And I want to suggest to you tonight that loving Jesus does not necessarily mean you are competent. We have to understand competence in a particular way. And of course, we also use the term professional in a similar way to the way that we use the word competence. An academic. Uh, you know the experiences I do, that sometimes the word professional is used pejoratively. It's a swear word. Uh, because I do some fundraising in my job as president of Regent College, uh, I will sometimes run into people and they'll say, uh, I hope you don't do fundraising in a professional way. And I say, what, what do you mean by that? Slick. And I take out my Roger's thesaurus and look up slick, and it doesn't say professional. And I look up professional, it doesn't say slick. But the term all of a sudden now has been associated with that which is slick and that which is not genuine and that which is not spontaneous. And so if something's done really well and people are threatened by it, they dub it professional. Of course, what that leads to in the secular culture is sometimes people come into churches and we have such low quality in what we do, they're not interested. But we're afraid of being professional. The same is true, it seems to me, in how women are assessed in our culture. One of the problems women have in our culture, whether they believe in the ordination or they don't believe in the ordination of women or how 1 Timothy 2 is exegeted, one of the realities in our contemporary culture, and sad to say in our Christian church as well, competent women are often threatening to people. And at the risk of being blunt, if they're competent and attractive, they're more threatening. So you have this quandary that many of us have in Christian ministry and in pastoral ministry. What does it mean to be competent? And is that even important? Does that really matter? And I think one of the sad things in the Church of Jesus Christ right now is that many of us believe that the only thing that matters is character and competence is irrelevant. But competence does matter. And so we're going to explore that together tonight. And I'll come back to some of my own biography in a moment. Let me start with the question, what does it mean to be professional? Now this term is used a lot. I was interested and, and thrilled to be here this week to be at the inauguration of this new center for Charles Taylor. And I was interested listening to the speeches and listening to some of the things that were said that the word professional appeared a number of times. And I, I don't know if you have these moments, maybe it suggests my bizarre approach to life, but I'd, I'd love to stop at those moments and say, now, how do you understand that word? How do you understand it? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? And of course, because everyone in the room was very positive on Charles Taylor and what he's done, I'm sure the gloss was very positive, but I know, and you know, in some Christian situations, if you call something professional, that's a bad thing. Christians are something else. They're not professional. So what is a professional? Well, let me go to the sociology of professions and try to unpack this as a secular person would unpack it and talk about the three traditional understandings of professionalism. The trade approach, the power approach, and the functionalist approach. First of all, the trade approach. When I go to my dentist, uh, not one of my favorite activities, but when I do go to my dentist and I sit in the chair and I open my mouth and she starts peering in, I make a number of assumptions. I assume, because she's a dentist, and because she has that DDS degree up on the wall, that behind her is this vast array of skill. I've always been intrigued why people want to be dentists. It always fascinates me why would, you would want to look in somebody's mouth all day. But clearly people feel called to that kind of work, and in some cases called to that kind of ministry. But as she's working away in my mouth, and she's poking here and prodding there and asking if this hurts and that hurts, and then I give her my visa card when I leave, and I won't make any jokes about that. Um, one of the things that I realize is that she's a professional. It's not the coat she's wearing, although it's interesting, many professionals do wear white coats, which is a signal they're professional. But why, why I know she's professional is she's trained as a dentist and somebody is certified that she has a body of knowledge and skills behind her out of which she speaks. And one of the reasons I know she's a professional, 
is if I went down the road to another dentist, I would assume the same level of knowledge and skills and the same certification by some accrediting body to say she is a dentist. She is a professional. She is professing a set of knowledge and skills behind her that I don't have. Now, I would like to think I have expertise in my teeth, but I don't. And I'm at the stage where I want to hum, crown him with many crowns at this stage of my life because it, that seems to be all I do in the dentist's office now. We need a crown here, we need a crown there, a crown somewhere else, $850 here, $850 there. She's a professional. What can I say to her? We don't break up into small groups and discuss it together. That's not what we do. She's a pro. I'm not a pro. I open my mouth. She does the work. I pay the bill. That's a professional. I assume that she has education what kind of education she has, where she got it, what the focus is, I don't know. But she was prepared for mouths, right? That's what she's prepared for. She was prepared for working in people's mouths. Now, are pastors professionals by the trait definition? Is there a set of knowledge and skills that are exclusive to pastors that distinguish them from the rest of the world? Can you go to one pastor or go to another pastor and assume the same body of knowledge and skill and expertise that others in the church don't have? And that's a little awkward to answer, isn't it? Because you've been in churches, not your current one because your pastor's here, but other churches you've been to, uh, you know you've been to churches where you wonder if there is a set of knowledge and skills behind the pastor and whether she is really professing knowledge of something and is functioning on that basis. And many of us have been in churches where there's people sitting in the pew that have way more expertise and skill and knowledge than the person standing in the pulpit. We call them laity, and we call the people up here clergy, but we fail to realize that some may be competent and some may not. And of course, if I read Ephesians 4 accurately, the person up here should have a set of knowledge and skills to equip other people to be competent. So it's confusing, the trade approach, when it comes to the sociology profession. The second one is the power approach. I had a physical recently, my apologies if this illustration offends you, I hope it won't, physical recently, nurse came up, said, Rod Wilson, I stood up, I know what that means, uh, I, you know, she's got a white coat on as well, it's not a psychiatric facility, but she calls my name, I walk into the office, she says, go into the office and take your clothes off. Now you can imagine if some sort of woman in a white coat came up to me on the main street in Wolfville and said, take your clothes off, I'd probably phone the police. Uh, or I'd run away. I'd do a Joseph and Potiphar's wife thing. I, I don't know what I'd do. I'd, I'd leave. But this woman in a white coat says, take your clothes off because you're going to have a physical and sit on the chair. And you know, many of you know that experience. Not all the men because some of you don't go to doctors. But many of you know the experience <laughs> of sitting there in the office with very little on waiting for the doctor to come. You're cold. You're uncomfortable. You sort of feel strange. You don't know what to, you know, do you put your hands over your head? What, what do you do? You're just sitting there. It's uncomfortable. Now, why do I do that? This strange woman, we're not even on a first name basis. She knows my name, I don't know her name, and she tells me to take my clothes. Why do I do that? She's a professional. And that's how I respond to professionals. A professional, in this sense, it's an assertion of power. Professionals have power over us, they have social advantage over us, and most of the time, they have an earning capacity that transcends our own earning capacity. And that gives them that professional status. That's the power approach. What they require in order to function well is uncertainty in the people they're dealing with, mastery in the people that they're dealing with, and vulnerability in the people that they're dealing with. Right? By definition, it's a power relationship. There's an inequality when it comes to power. This person's the competent one, this person is not. And I won't go through all the details of a physical, but some of you have been there, done that, and you could think of some of the illustrations I could use. And if we were going to break up into small groups and say, let's talk about whether I'm going to let you even do that to me, that's not, that doesn't work, right? The doctor says, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this, and my doctor's all on the computer now, so he says, what do you want to know? And he pushes the button, it all comes up. I'm hoping he forgot the old cholesterol test, but it's all there on the screen in a bar graph now. It's all in front of me. That's the pro in action. Now, professionals, in this sense, are not engaged in co-pilgrimage. They're not walking together. My doctor doesn't say, you know, let me tell you, Rod, I'm really struggling right now. Like I'm having, and I say, well, tell me more about that. Let's, let's discuss this together. 
That doesn't happen. It's not, there's not a mutuality in it. He's the professional. And if I conceptualize pastoral ministry that, that way, is it a power relationship with the people I lead, in fact, are under me, and I'm leading them because I have more expertise? See, that becomes a problem, too. In the first one, in the trade approach, the culture is changing so rapidly, those of us in theological education are constantly asked the question now, what is it we train pastors to do? Because if you train to specialization in this culture, by the time they graduate, the culture's changed. So what do you do in training pastors? In the power approach, all you need is people who want to be in charge and in control. And as Henri Nouwen says, people who are interested in building power kingdoms without intimacy and relationships. That's what you want with these kind of pastors. But that doesn't seem right either. What about the third approach? The functionalist approach. This is a recent critique of the last three decades that says because of the downturn of the family and the absence of thinking communally, we now rely on professionals to do things that we cannot do for ourselves. So because the community doesn't function the way it used to function, because the neighborhood doesn't function the way it used to function, because the family doesn't function the way it used to function, now we hire people to do it. Now, I'm a mental health professional. That was my original training. I don't do that now, although uh, sometimes with faculty I do it. Uh, but that's another subject for another seminar. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that we now have this category in recent decades called helping professions? It's a very interesting contradiction in terms. The whole notion of helping, which seems to come from altruism and a, and a good spirit and a desire to reach out to others and care for them, now has been elevated to a profession. And you know in the evangelical church, people with PhDs in clinical psychology get all kinds of inroads into the church now because they're in the helping professions. It's a very interesting dynamic because the functionalism of certain professions in their replacement of what used to happen with the neighborhood and with the community and with the family have now actually got into a profession that might not have happened before if the culture had been different. And this critique would say that privatization, specialization, urbanization have all created more of a need for pastors. And there's a sense in which the way the culture is gone, because people don't want to do things for themselves or for each other, they need to get a professional in order to make that work happen. The church that we're in, we're finding we have to pay most people now to do most jobs that I remember, even as a 58-year-old, people used to volunteer for. So now we have to put money in. And of course, that's one of the traditional definitions of what it means to be a professional. Professionals get paid. Volunteers don't. And once you understand that, then you recognize that maybe the very role of the pastor comes into question if we were all doing our job. Now, one shouldn't say this with a whole bunch of denominational leadership sitting in a room, but it's a question worth asking. What, in fact, is the role of the pastor in this kind of a culture? And if it is an Ephesians 4 equipping role, is the mobilization of the community, in fact, what we need to be doing to move us back where people are, in fact, engaging in ministry and not just the person in the front. So when you ask the professional question and you kind of look through this little sub-window of what does it mean to be a professional, it seems to me the competence, thing, competence issue is a bit confusing and it's hard to understand. So let's ask the question more directly. What does it mean to be competent? Now one of the problems with this term, competence, is it tends to be a binary dichotomous term. And by that I simply mean you're either seen as competent or seen as incompetent. That typically is the way we read it. It's the way we use it. And our feminist friends have, have helped us tremendously to help us understand that language helps form reality. So if our language is somebody's either competent or incompetent, that's the kind of language we use, then we start to believe that that's the way the world is. We're either competent or we're incompetent. Now, all of us who have master's degrees in here, I have a couple of master's degrees, and just exegete that just slowly for a moment. A master's degree. And do you remember walking across the stage when you got your master's degree? 
Your experience inside, unless you're arrogant or comatose, and that could be true for some of you, but if you weren't arrogant and you weren't comatose, as you walked across the stage and were given this master's degree, what they're telling you is you have a master of divinity, you have a master of arts, you have a master of theology, whatever it was for you. They're telling you you're competent. And you all know the famous proverb, those who have it on the wall don't always have it on the ball, right? You, you know that one. So the fact that you have a master's degree uh, doesn't, you don't necessarily feel like you have a master's degree. In fact, you feel quite inadequate. Because one of the great things with education is the more you have, the more you realize you don't know very much. Right? It's always people, the people who don't have education always worry about those of us who have that will be arrogant. My experience is often the people who don't have education that are more arrogant about the fact they don't have education than those of us who have education are arrogant about the fact we have. And if you're trying to write that down, my apologies. See, the dynamic there is competence is either you have it or you don't. So when you come to pastoral leadership or you come to lay leadership in the church, and obviously all of us want to be competent. We want to do a competent job. When I was preparing for this, I don't think, eh, I'm just going to wing it. You know, I'll, I'll put it together before supper. No, I, I thought through it, prayed through it, researched it, was careful, tried to put things together, tried to give you notes. I wanted this to be competent. I think that's important. I'm going to fly across the country and wing it. I want this to be done well. I want this to be done with quality and competence important. But when a Wilson says that, for those of you here last week, you're going to get down all kinds of dark alleys there and get yourself in trouble. You want to be a competent pastor. You want to be a competent leader, whatever your, your area is. What does that look like? Now, my experience in leadership, and in this next section I'm going to be quite biographical, my experience in leadership is that many of us have defined competence in a particular way, and then we have myths about all these things on the side. I think the greatest tragedy in the current culture in which we live is fragmentation. We're not holistic anymore. We're not integrated anymore. We're fragmented. We slice people, places off. Those of us who are in my age group, we used to do that with the secular sacred, right? This is sacred, this is secular. But now in leadership, we start slicing things off. We say, well, that's not part of leadership. That's not part of, no, that's not part of leadership. To be a leader, you need to be this. And all of a sudden, we give people the message that leadership is this, and it's very truncated, very narrow, and these other things can't enter in. But when you look at the biblical text, and you look at the way we're supposed to live as Christians, and Christian always needs to precede leader, how we need to lead as, lead as Christians is to not see these things as discrepant from who we are, but in fact fold them in and recognize this is part of our leadership. And that's been my own journey, and I want to share a little bit of that with you tonight. One of the things that I've struggled with in the culture, and again, when one tells story, uh, I'm not evaluating as good or bad, right or wrong, I'm just telling you. Some of what I'm telling you is sad, some of what I'm going to tell you is, is not appropriate, but I'm just telling you honestly. One of the sets of literature that I found really difficult is the literature on excellence and the literature on success. In fact, if you go into a typical Christian bookstore that sells poor Christian books, and there are incompetent Christian books, I hope, I hope you know that, that none written by anyone in this room, but other rooms, um, incompetent Christian books will constantly be parading this excellence and success word over and over and over again. Many schools are into that as well. In fact, if you do a survey of the 252 accredited theological schools in North America, you will find many of them are trying to produce leaders with excellence or leaders who will be successful. As soon as you hold excellence and you hold success up against leadership, one of the things you're talking about now is you're saying, don't bring your limitations to the table. Don't bring your weaknesses to the table. Don't bring your frailties to the table. I think in a very interesting way, Parker Palmer, and this is from Let Your Life Speak, I didn't get that in the parenthesis there, Parker Palmer says this, limitations and liabilities are the flip side of our gifts. A particular weakness is the inevitable trade-off for a particular strength. We will become better not by trying to fill the potholes in our souls, but by knowing them so well that we can avoid falling into them. Have you noticed that in your own life? That it's not a case of I have a list of strengths over here and a list of weaknesses over here. I have a list of strengths over here and I have limitations over here. And to be a leader, I need to stay over here all the time and just pretend those don't exist. What I need to recognize is that in fact my limitations or my weaknesses or my liabilities are, are exactly the flip side of this. So I'm a person, for example, who's very organized. 
uh, very strong administratively. That's been a strength I've had a lot of my life. I'm very, very good at that. But if I push that too far, it can become inhumane and oppressive. And many of you have served under that kind of administrative leadership. So it's not that administration is a weakness or administration is a strength. It's more administration is one of my qualities, and depending on the direction I go, it can become a strength or a weakness. And it seems to me we who are in leadership, and pastoral leadership, need to be aware, it's the double knowledge we talked about from Calvin's Institutes last night, we need to be aware of not just our strengths and weaknesses, but we need to be aware of our qualities that can go in both ways. Some of you are really personal and personable and relational and pastoral and you give yourselves to people. Is that a strength or a weakness? It depends, right? It depends. Some of you have gone way down the road in certain situations and you should have put the brakes on long ago in that relationship. You stopped loving the other person and what is love? Doing what is in their best interest and you live constantly out of your need to give and to relate. You're not bad relationally. It's not a limitation. It's in fact one of your qualities, but it can go both directions. And it seems to me, if I am competent, I will have limitations. That's just what I am. That's who I am. That's a nature of what I am like. So first, if I'm competent, I won't have limitations. Misses what leadership is really about. Secondly, if I'm competent, I won't suffer. Some of you may remember the book by the uh, Jewish rabbi, Harold Kushner, whose uh, son died of a premature aging disease as a teenager and looked like an old man and passed away. And he wrote that uh, famous book, uh, Why Do Good Things Happen, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And that book became a bestseller, I think, for all kinds of reasons. But one of the reasons it became a bestseller is because that's the natural theology that a lot of people hold. Even secular people hold that kind of thing. That if something goes right, means I'm doing the right thing. If something goes wrong, it means I'm doing the wrong thing. So if I'm a good person and bad things happen, something's amiss. Uh, those of you who play golf, you've had the experiences I have. You know, you're on the first tee, you hit the ball, and it sort of drifts off to the right, and there's a big thwack in the forest as the ball hits the tree, and then it comes bouncing out and lands in the middle of the fairway. And the person you're playing golf with almost always says, you must be living right. Right? They never say anything when the ball stays in the bush. But when it bounces back out again, they say you must be living right because the assumption is that if something good happened, you must have been behind that. This is where grace becomes important again, right? I perform, good things will happen. Kushner said, I'm a good person. He actually wrote that way in the book. I'm a good person. Why, why are bad things happening? Why did my son die? It's an echo of Psalm 73, right? I love Psalm 73. I, I understand Psalm 73. Why do the wicked prosper? Like, have you asked that question recently? Lots of wicked people do really, really well. And it violates our natural sense of justice, our, our kind of natural theology, that if, if the wicked are prospering and they're wicked and they're prospering, it doesn't make any sense. If they're doing well and they're, and they're acting poorly, it shouldn't happen. It's not right. I'll be honest. I've assumed, with some embarrassment, that committing myself to Christian ministry committing myself to Christian leadership, committing myself to Christian higher education, committing myself to pastoral leadership would mean I'd kind of be pain-free. I love Peter. Do not be surprised at the painful trial you're experiencing as though something strange were happening to you. You know sometimes the Bible, it's like a screwdriver right between the eyes. That's what it feels like to me when I read that, because that's exactly my mindset. Quietly. I remember when we were in Toronto, Bev was working in the inner city with street kids. And I was working part-time in pastoral ministry and part-time in a Christian college. And we'd done what a lot of young couples do. You know, you get married, you're going to have children in three years, and then the three years came, and then the four years came, and then the five years came, and then the six years came, and the seven years came, and the eight years came. And any of you who've been through this, you understand that we had the big eye on our forehead infertility. 
We were in a church that did not believe children were a gift of God, that it came from some kind of sexual relationship. That's what most people believe. That wasn't a gift of God. And we were in a lot of pain over that. And we were in a lot of difficulty over that. And it didn't make sense to me. Why were we struggling with infertility? And why was Bev working with people that walked down the street and got pregnant and slept over grates in the middle of the winter just to get some heat for their baby? Or had a baby in one arm and a a couple of pet rats in the other arm. And I thought, this is not fair. This is not right. This this shouldn't be happening. I shouldn't be suffering because I'm doing this kind of work. And and we need to have some sense of natural justice here. If Bev's committed to the inner city and I'm committed to Christian education and pastoral ministry, then we cannot be having problems with infertility. And I remember one day getting a phone call person on the other end of the phone doesn't know if we have children, doesn't know anything about our struggle with infertility, doesn't know much about our family at all, has never met Bev, met me briefly and said, I feel really strange making this call, but every time this other person prays about this single teenager in the United States who's pregnant, every time this person prays, the name Rod Wilson comes to mind. Does this mean anything to you? And I've read books about this, and I've heard people talk about this. I've never had this experience before. And I went upstairs, and I guess I was white as a sheet, like I'd seen a ghost, the Holy Ghost. And Bev had just come home from the mission, and I told her the story. She said, I've been praying all the way home at the mission about your attitude towards adoption. And you know how we talk about sovereignty as an ideology, as some kind of a theological construct? It was like God's sovereignty just kind of came together in a very, very powerful way. And all of a sudden, there was a part of me, way deep inside the inner recesses of my being, that thought, now, this is starting to be fair. So we went and were interviewed by this teenager. We were 35. She only knew how to have sex. She didn't know much about parenting. But she interviewed us and decided we could be the parents of her child. But we had to be at the delivery. That's what she wanted. So we were at the delivery. When she went into labor, we went to the delivery. It's the worst night of my life. They couldn't get her out. There was all kinds of problems. And she was born with multiple disabilities. She was in that hospital about an hour, and then they put her in an ambulance. I'll never forget that night. That ambulance drove away with Jessica in the back of the ambulance. The adoption stopped because she was disabled. We had to get reassessed again. And all I could think is, this is cruel. This is so unfair. And all the people around us felt the same way. They reinforced that, that you should not have to go through this kind of pain, this kind of anguish because of the kind of life you're living. No grace in that, right? And the Wilson side of me responded to that so well. If I've done this, then why is this happening? It doesn't make sense. And then you start to realize that suffering is not something that's outside the experience of the Christian leader, but in my experience, the vast majority of Christian leaders have suffering in their life. And at the risk of making some of you feel very uncomfortable tonight, if you're in pastoral leadership and you don't have suffering in your life, I would be preparing and praying really hard. And I don't say that for humorous reasons. I think most of God's servants who seek to follow Jesus are going to follow a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And so this oft-quoted passage in Henri Nouwen's book, The Wounded Healer, is so true. I'd like to think if I'm competent, I won't suffer. But he says, our fragmented life experiences combined with our sense of urgency do not allow for a handbook for ministers. After all attempts to articulate the predicament of modern man, the necessity to articulate the predicament of the minister himself became most important. Listen to this. The minister is called to recognize the sufferings of his time in his own heart and make that recognition the starting point of his service. Whether he tries to enter into a dislocated world, relate to a convulsive generation, or speak to a dying man, his service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart wounded by the suffering about which he speaks. You see what Nowen is saying? For many of us in leadership, and I'm a great example of this, for many of us in leadership, we look outside at suffering 
and we look at the difficulties of other people, and we define ourselves as pastors of ministering to the needs of other people. But the fundamental reality is we have suffering in our own hearts, and that's the place we start with our service. I have felt like a broken, wounded man for 24 years. And I'm not saying that for pedagogical effect. I'm not saying that to elicit sympathy. It's just the truth. I have had pain for 24 years. And what I would like to do is think this is not part of being in leadership. This is something off to the side of leadership. And I'm slowly realizing that I need to get this off the side and recognize with now and that it's in the brokenness of my heart that I start to get a little glimpse into the nature of the gospel. And so I say to you who are here, don't compare, don't compare my story with your story. I'm not telling it for that reason. Just think of your own life right now. Many of you have pain in your life right now. Many have real difficulties in your life right now. And the problem is not the presence of the difficulty. The problem is you still see it as an interruption to your leadership. It's part of your leadership. And it may be a necessary requirement of being in leadership. It's a myth. If I am competent, I won't suffer. Next, if I am competent, I won't be vulnerable. In my own life, as probably with many of you in this room, I have battled low-grade depression most of my life. I've been for counseling a number of times during the course of my life for low-grade depression. I remember in Toronto once going to see a counselor, a Christian counselor, who had an office in a public area. And I will never forget this moment because it was one of those moments, and when we tell our stories, we often we can hear the formative nature of these moments. It was a formative moment for me. I parked the car. And I walked across the street, and as I was parkway across the street, I realized this is a very public area, and I was going into this counselor's office, and it was really clear it was a counseling office. It wasn't hidden, it wasn't obscured, it was really obvious. And as I walked across the street, I caught myself looking over my shoulder to see if anyone was watching. And here I am in pastoral leadership, inviting others to be vulnerable, to be open, to be broken, to recognize that the gospel requires weakness and vulnerability and transformity. That, that's the nature of the gospel. The gospel is not about being strong. It's not about having your life together. The nature of the gospel, both pre-conversion and post-conversion, is to recognize you live in complete vulnerability and complete dependence and complete weakness. I'm inviting people Sunday after Sunday to that, but I was painfully aware that I did not want to go through that. I did not want to be seen. And the superficial side of me said, well, you know, it won't be good for people in the church because, you know, and I, it had nothing to do with the people in the church. I just didn't want to be seen going in. I didn't want to be seen as vulnerable. And my colleague Maxine Hancock wrote an article a number of years ago called To Be Fully Human, and she captures it well for me when she says, the greater strength we have in some area of human excellence, intellect, beauty, physical strength, the harder it is to embrace the reality of our vulnerability, which is a condition of being human. One of the things I've realized, friends, and you may want to tackle me on this theologically or biblically or whatever other way, but one of the things I've realized is I try to be in Christian leadership and in pastoral ministry and be not human. And I realize the best thing I can offer in pastoral leadership is to be a human redeemed by Jesus Christ. And humans have vulnerability. Every single person in this room, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, I don't care how long you've served, I don't care how many countries in the world you've preached, doesn't matter. Every single person in this room has vulnerability, and it's part of being human. And if we understand that, that we don't fall into the myth that in order to be a leader, I don't have to be vulnerable. The next one I'm going to spend a little more time on, because this is where God has worked the most in my life. If I'm competent, I won't feel weak. Jessica had neurosurgery four days after she was born. It didn't work. She had neurosurgery then 12 days after she was born. Because it was a vaginal delivery, she had frontal lobe damage of the brain, which is where impulse control is. Kicked in the pituitary gland, so she started puberty at age two. She was diagnosed with autism. She's been in hospital about 30 times in the last 10 years. She has a genius IQ. 
There's a lot of other things I could say, but I'm not going to say publicly. Every single day of my life, I feel frail and broken and weak. Every time we travel, it'll happen again tonight, we go into the hotel room, I open up the door and look for the red light to be flashing. 95% of the time when it's flashing, it's another Jessica crisis. Day after day after day after day after day, I feel so weak. And for a Wilson, this is awful. It's awful. Because it's not supposed to happen. We, we throw work at things when there's a problem. I can't throw work at this. I just feel weak. And she feels weak. And she's also victimized by a lot of these things that have happened to her and has her own pain and her own trauma. Our marriage has been in dire straits. And any of you who have had disabled children, you understand this. Our marriage has been in dire straits in the last 20 years on a number of occasions because 98% of our conversation is about how we deal with this issue. It's been incredibly painful and incredibly weak. And I want the Lord to take it away. It's an interruption. I have other things to do. This is something over here, and what I've had to realize is that this is not an interruption into my life. This is my life. This is part of being the president of Regent College. And some days I walk in so broken and so frail and so beat up in all sorts of ways, literally and metaphorically, and look at the sign of the door and I laugh out loud. I think, I can't believe that person is this person. It's so removed. And again, please don't get caught in the illustration. I'm assuming a level of maturity here that we're not going to compare our war stories and see who's the worst. But everyone in this room probably has a Jessica story of some sort or other. Some of you are in the early stages of it. Some of you are in the middle. Some of you are in the late stages. But many of us in this room have Jessica stories that make you profoundly weak, profoundly dependent, and you know in the providence of God he could remove this problem for you, but for whatever reason he's chosen not to remove the problem for you. And so you keep going day by day. And that's why I love 2 Corinthians 12. Because Paul came, and I think it's a paradigmatic chapter, in the sense that it doesn't tell us precisely what the thorn in the flesh was, which is lovely. But what it does say is Paul was having some suffering, whether it was eyes or skin or whatever. You've done, some of you have done the work on this. Who knows what it was. But what it says was over a 14-year period in 2 Corinthians 12, he had this problem, which is, was to keep him from being conceited, which is an interesting notion. And it says... He came to Jesus three times and said, take it away. I don't know how much of a literalist you are tonight. I don't know what three times means in 14 years. Once every five years? I, I don't know what that line means. But he came. And what was Jesus' response? No. I'm not taking it away. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, that for me has become life-saving in the last 25 years. My grace is sufficient for you. Many nights, some of you could tell these stories, I wonder, I'm not convinced, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's sufficient, and I'm not sure grace is even operative. But I realize that his grace is sufficient, and the reason is because of what the rest of the passage says. And look at it, it's on the page in front of you there. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, in Jessica stories. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I used to live my Christian life this way, and my apologies to those of you listening and not seeing this visually, but I used to live my life this way. This was weakness, this was strength. And I'd run, try to get away from weakness, try to be a good Wilson, be strong, get your life together. You got two master's degrees, two doctoral degrees, you should know what you're about. And then, you know, I'd feel weak again, I'd go back down like this. And then I'd run up again, try to be strong, be, you know, you need to do this, you need to, and then I'd run back down again. And that was my view of it. And I would read books about the victorious Christian life. They think, oh, that's what that's about. I've got to get the victorious Christian life. And I gotta, I'm working like crazy to live the victorious Christian life. I can't even spell grace. And up and down and up and down and back and forth. And you know what? If you run forwards and backwards every day, it's exhausting. 
It's absolutely exhausting. It, but it's not what the passage teaches. It doesn't say, my grace is sufficient for you, so you're living the victorious Christian life all the time. It doesn't say that. It says, when I am weak, then I am strong. You see the difference? When you live your life this way, it's totally different than living your life this way, of running up and down and sliding back and trying to be strong. Trying to be strong. Of all people, we should know how foolish that is. Try to be strong. And I'm here to say, not as some great adulation of what I've done, that the grace of God moves us to the place that when we're in Christian leadership, we will feel weak. And I now worry when I feel strong. And if many of us in leadership, and particularly those of you who have responsibilities like I have at this conference, could tell the truth about this to people, just be honest about this, and speak it from the Bible, and stop dressing it up, that everyone feels like they have to be obsessively compulsive, perfectionistic in their leadership, and recognize many of us in pastoral leadership feel weak and dependent and frail. And I'm not talking about what you share, what you say in sermons. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the inside of us. I don't tell the Jessica story every time I speak. I don't talk about my brokenness ever. I don't, every sermon, I don't break into something about child rearing. I don't do that. But inside I recognize the weakness that only God's grace is sufficient to move me from running up and down, trying to be strong, to recognizing that when I am weak, then I am strong. The last myth. If I am competent, I won't show my true self. I call these Civil War story pastors. Pastors whose illustrations are always about the Civil War, or about a bygone day when you weren't alive and they weren't alive either. Just old, old stories. Or preacher stories. And people, you go to their church for five years and listen to them, you haven't got the foggiest idea what's going on in their lives because not only can they not tell you about them real, their real selves, but they have lost their real selves a long time ago. They don't know who they are anymore. They have got them so absorbed in the role, they do pastor speak and can't speak English anymore. And when pastors fall into that, and pastoral leaders fall into that, that we're not, we're not in tune with our real self in the way we talked about last night, we fall into what Parker Palmer talks about in his book, A Hidden Wholeness. And let me read that quote. Thomas Merton claimed that there is in all things a hidden wholeness. But back in the human world, where we are less self-revealing than jack pines, Merton's words can at times sound like wishful thinking. Afraid that our inner life will be extinguished or our inner darkness exposed, we hide our true identities from each other. In the process, we become separated from our own souls. We end up living divided lives, so far removed from the truth we hold within that we cannot know the integrity that comes from being what you are. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life, Knowing this gives me hope that human wholeness, mine, yours, ours, need not be a utopian dream if we can use devastation as a seedbed for new life. I say this with some pain and some anguish, but if you said to me, where have you learned the most about the gospel when you did your theological training? Mm -mm. Where have you learned the most about the gospel when you're in pastoral ministry? Mm -mm. Where have you learned the most about the gospel when you were in theological education? Mm -mm. Where have you learned the most about the gospel when you were in secular work? Mm -mm. You know where I've learned the most about the gospel? Jessica. I have learned more about the gospel from having this child than anything else in the face of the earth. And the pain of that experience, her pain, our pain, my pain, has become a seedbed for new life. I've never been the same since she was born. Never been the same. And never will be the same. It's a seedbed for new life, but it's awful. And in that sense, that's my true self. And so then, given those reflections on competence, what does it mean for us to be Christian professionals? 
whether we're in a traditional pastoral role or lay pastoral role, whatever it might be, what does it mean to be deeply spiritual and competent? And where do I, the self, that other part of the two, the, the double knowledge, where do I fit into this? Frederick Beekner, in his book, Telling Secrets, says this to those of us in pastoral ministry in a very blunt way, and so I'll say it, quoting him, rather than say it myself. Ministers run the awful risk, in other words, of ceasing to be witnesses to the presence in their own lives, let alone in the lives of the people they're trying to minister to, of a living God who transcends everything. They think they know and can say about him and is full of extraordinary surprises. Instead, they tend to become professionals who've mastered all the techniques of institutional religion and who speak on religious matters with what often seems a maximum of authority and a minimum of vital personal involvement. Their sermons often sound as bland as they sound bloodless. The faith they proclaim appears to be no longer rooted in or nourished by or challenged by their own lives, but instead free-floating, second-hand, passionless. Obviously, ministers are not called to be, in that sense, professionals. God forbid. I believe that they are called instead, together with all other Christians and would-be Christians, to consider the lilies of the field, consider the least of these, my brethren, to consider the dead sparrow by the roadside. Maybe prerequisite to all those, they are called upon to consider themselves, what they love, what they fear, what they are ashamed of, what makes them sick to their stomachs what rejoices their hearts. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, friends, but when I read this, I just don't want to be like the kind of person that Beekner's criticizing. I don't want to be a person who has a maximum of authority and a minimal personal involvement. I don't want to be a person who is not nourished by and challenged by the gospel that I'm inviting others to be in. And it seems to me evangelism in the way that we've moved in this culture that's become more specialized and more focused has often forgot the old notion that what we're called to be is witnesses to the presence in our own lives. And if we stay distant and stay removed and the gospel doesn't interact with our own Jessica story, whatever that might be for us, in that sense we're not professing, we're not witnessing to the life that we've experienced in Christ. And this is why I think at the end, and this will be my final quote, at the end I think Parker Palmer is right when he says this in his act of life. Listen to his words. As professionals, we like to define ourselves in ways that stress competence, high standards, an ethic of service, personal sacrifice, and so on. A professional is a person who has invested long hours and much money to develop an allegedly rare ability that others can be convinced to need and to purchase at a high price. In fact, the full-fledged professional has the power and sometimes the necessity to extend the world of objects even further to make objects of other people. At root, a professional is one who makes a profession of faith. Faith in something larger and wiser than his or her own powers. The true professional is a person whose action points beyond his or herself to that underlying reality, that hidden wholeness on which we all can rely. And this, my friends, is the invitation to be a professional. It's to say, behind me I have this gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, whose central icon is the cross, where suffering and pain and difficulty, even Jesus, the Hebrew writer tells us, learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And what we do as we stand, whether it's in pulpits or in jails or in hospitals or wherever it might be in, in people's homes, we stand and we are a professional in the sense that we offer to them this gospel in a very powerful way, not in a distant way, not in a removed way, but in a way where that gospel has flowed through us and people can witness the power of the gospel in our own lives in whatever way that fits for your story whatever way that fits in the way that God has worked in your life. And in that sense, I'm professing something that I believe in. In that sense, we need to be professionals. In that sense, we need to be competent. And so in conclusion, I want to suggest something about the Olympic debate 
We've talked a lot about being professional tonight. And you know the issues around competence and professionalism. We've talked about that in the last period of time. But you know in the Olympics, one of the great tensions is should we pay our athletes professional or should we let them be amateurs? You remember amateur, for those of you taking Latin? What is amateur? Doing it for love. Amateur. The Christian world needs more professional pastors, but it also needs a lot more amateurs. Let's just bow silently for a few moments before we have some questions. Amen. Let me take uh, a few minutes for some questions or what's, uh, I want to submit to the powers that be here. Thank you for asking that, Rod, just as a word with the president. And uh, together we feel as if we would need to leave the questions for tomorrow. There's a sense of the presence of the Lord in this place through the presentation this evening. And we would like to offer rather um, just a time for some prayer. Good. And um, I hope you understand the, 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 this, the, the very nature of the presentation this evening that challenges and invites us as pastors and spouses and uh, lay and clergy and what have you to, to really to grasp something more, to offer ourselves for something more. I can't explain it better than that. But there's a sense in inviting us to seek the Lord's presence for something more. So, Rod, would you lead us as yeah. God leads you on that, and then we'll have a closing yeah. benediction of some yeah. sort. I realize this doesn't fit with all of your traditions, and physically it may not be appropriate for all of you either, but if you're comfortable kneeling, uh, let's kneel together. If you're not, that's not a problem, but if you are, let's kneel. Father, our posture before you tonight reflects the attitude of our hearts that we are dependent on you. This is a position of mercy, and we need your mercy. I pray tonight, Father, for those who are here that are struggling with their own Jessica story right now and are feeling frail and weak and dependent. Often in these kind of events, people come and are deciding maybe to give all this up. And I pray you'll give them a fresh sense of your grace tonight. I pray for those who are living superficially. They may be veterans. They may have been in leadership for a long time. But deep in their hearts and in the heart of their spouse, they both know they're living superficially. Their life and their sermons are bland and bloodless. Would you, through the work of your Spirit, empower them to have a fresh sense of your truth and your gospel, that their lives may be reinvigorated again? I pray for the school that's seeking to teach women and men, seeking to lead them in an understanding of who you are, that you will protect the administration, the staff, the faculty, the board, and the students from triumphalist Christianity. Give them a fresh sense of their own brokenness institutionally and as individuals within it, that through the weakness of faculty and staff and administration and board, your strength will come. I thank you for the reminder in the Apostles' letter that we die so others can live. And so most of us in this room are constantly dying so others can experience life. Deepen our sense of call tonight 
Give us a renewed conviction and passion for what you've brought us into. And keep us, Father, very close to you in dependence. Many of us will have red lights on our phones when we go back to our room tonight, both literally and metaphorically. And may these red lights be constant reminders that we are not in control, but you are. We are not creator, but you are. We are not sovereign, but you are. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so, Father, in a fresh way tonight, use your word and your truth and this story, which is simply a story about you, to accomplish your purposes. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.